Hi and welcome into the lesson Botvinnik's winning method. Mikhail Botvinnik has been the world champion for around 13 years. Certainly there is something we can learn from his experience. For instance, in this lesson we'll learn how to dominate your opponents, restricting their counterplay while at the same time improving your own position gradually. Also we will analyze one very common mistake that many chess players make regularly in their games, therefore you can make sure that you don't fall into this trap. Of course there will be some other practical hints just as well. My name is Igor Smirnov, I'm international grandmaster and a chess coach from the Remote Chess Academy, and without further ado, let's get started. We can see a pretty typical position with a pawn structure that may happen in various closed openings, like Queen's Indian declined and so forth. Please think about it for a moment. How would you play here as black? It is black to move. If you really think yourself for a moment and only then listen to the remaining video, then it will be a real practical training for you and you will acquire the new practical skills. Did you come up with your solution? Okay, then let's go ahead. There are plenty of the logical things that Black may do here. For example, we can see there is an open file here and you may want to bring your heavy pieces there. Black may try to launch the attack on the king side with pushing his h-pawn and using the rook on the h8, which is currently dozing. Uh, maybe you want to support your rook with playing b5 and also you're trying to use your pawn majority on the queen side. You may want to care about your king safety and improve its position somehow. For example, play g6 followed by king g7. All in all, there are a lot of various options that black has here. So, which one is the best? That's the good question, right? A few centuries ago, Chess players suffered for lack of chess knowledge. They simply didn't know how to proceed. Nowadays we have the opposite problem. We know so many different rules about chess that it becomes re really hard to follow them and to decide what is the most important. That's why I like to share with you one very simple practical recommendation that will make it a lot easier for you. Here is the advice, play in the center. Very often chess players have doubts like how to evaluate a position, how to choose the right plan. Now you know one very simple rule about that. Just play in the center. If you can do that, if there is the opportunity for you to do something in the center to strengthen your control over the central squares, then you should be doing just that. If you have the good control over the central squares, then you dominate the position. After that, your attack on any area of the chessboard will be successful. On the contrary, if you're lacking control in the center and trying some active operations on a flank, most likely you'll fail. Let's apply this recommendation here. Ok, first of all, let's start from the very beginning. When we're talking about the center, we're talking about the central squares, the four squares in the very center of the board. In addition to that, we may talk about the adjoining territory, which is also pretty important. Therefore, your task is to control those squares as much as you can and try to occupy them with your pieces. For example, in the current position the rook on the c4 is already occupying the central square while the knight on the f6 is controlling the e4 square and you only hope to occupy it later on in the future. As we can see, black may hope to occupy those two important central squares, the e4 and the c4 square, therefore the whole black's plan revolves around this idea. The next step for you is to think about the pieces that you have and think how you can use them in the best way to influence those central squares. For example, let's think about the dark squared bishop. 
how can it help you in this plan? Well, you can move it to B4, where it will look at it at White's C3 knight, and you'll be ready to eliminate this knight anytime you need in the future, uh, making it easier for you to bring your own knight to E4 after that. As we've been talking about the rook and the knight, they are already standing on the pretty good squares. The bishop on the B zone is already controlling those important squares D5 and E4. Um, what about the the queen? Well, you certainly need to bring it somewhere, for instance, maybe to the E file, where it will also control the E4 square, or maybe to the C file, like that, or maybe through C8. In the future, after you develop your rook from the corner, it will also would love to stand either on the E file or on the C file. Oh, I've, not, I've made a lot of arrows here, but I hope that you understand now the key idea. When you know your plan, when you know exactly what you should be focusing on, it becomes very clear for you what you should be doing and where should you move your pieces to. By the way, we shouldn't forget about tactics. At the moment, white is threatening knight takes d5, and after that, your rook and the c4 will become unprotected. Okay, in the actual game, Botvinnik played queen to c8. Therefore, he's securing his rook on the c4, and at the same time is preparing the move queen to e6, where the queen will be extremely well placed, controlling both important squares e4 and c4. Let me also emphasize one another important aspect here. I'm pretty sure that a lot of players, while playing black here, would focus their attention on opponent's king, and they would think how to attack it. For example, your queen can go to h3, maybe with a knight to g4, you can push the h-pawn and just try to mate the king. That's how lots of players play blitz games and even standard games as well. It's pretty logical indeed. We know that in order to win a game you need to checkmate the opponent's king. That's why so many players like to play in the attacking style, to play gambits and to attack your castle. At the same time, it just does not work like that. As we have been already discussing, the greatest importance revolves around center. If you don't control the central squares good enough, your operations on the flank will fail. That's why the plan like that, to move the h-pawn, to bring the queen to h3, it's just the completely wrong idea. Okay, let's move on. White played rook a to c1. By the way, white also underestimates the importance of the center, otherwise he would break through in the center himself with e4, gaining an advantage there. Instead, white decided to put the rook on, a, on an open file, which is a good idea in general, but it's just not the most important thing in the position. So white played rook to c1, and black answered queen e6. White played bishop g2. You already can see that once black established the very good control over the central squares, it became a lot more difficult for white to do anything, to make any active operations. And the white's last move, bishop to g2, proves that white is unsure of what to do. Now black played h5. I've a little bit criticized this move on the previous turn, but you can see that besides an attacking attempt on the king side, the h5 move has another big idea, it's just to activate your rook. Of course, you can't play without one of your strongest pieces, you need to bring it into play, and h5 and h4 move is just an attempt to bring this rook into play. White played knight e2, now the rook on the c4 is being attacked, now how would you play here? Well, very easy, you need to strengthen your control over the square, so black played b5. Now knight f4, black moved the queen back, you don't want to trade opponent's knight for your bishop. Bishop generally is a little stronger than knight. White played queen d1, h4, queen f3. White finds it difficult to continue 
or rather to compose any constructive plan and therefore he just makes some maneuvers now he's he has prepared a tricky idea if black plays the move knight e4 which is his main intention in the given position it would fail due to knight g6 fog of course it may happen in a blitz game in a bullet game maybe but in a standard game against the world champion such an idea uh, will quite un unlikely will work uh, like just move the king to g8 white answered rook d1 now knight to e4 and black is dominating completely the followed knight d3 rook h6 i'm not commenting on these moves too much you just can see that white doesn't know what to do while black is improving his position gradually at the moment he is ready to play rook f6 putting even more pressure onto the white's position and after the following few moves white collapsed pretty quickly we will not analyze the whole game you can find a link to the whole game below the video and you can observe it yourself you'll see that black won it very easily now let's make a little summary if you can't play in the center you should do it this is the universal plan that works in almost every position. While most of the other players focus on the opponent's king and tend to play on the side, you should be focusing in the center and playing in the center. Practically, it means that first of all you need to control the central squares by your pieces, and secondly, you can occupy the central squares by just placing your pieces right there into those central squares. Then you will get the dominant position, and later on you'll be able to develop your attack in any direction you want. So, whenever you are unsure of which plan to choose, which plan is correct, just recollect this advice. Okay, now let's move on. In this position it is white to move. The white's d3 bishop is hanging. Obviously, why it should do something about it. What's your opinion about this question? How would you play here as white? I'm pretty sure that a lot of players would simply take the bishop on a 5, which is the easiest solution for the white's problem. And this is the very common mistake that lots of chess players fall into. The related rule is very simple. You should keep the tension. When there is some tension into the position, players tend to release the tension. You try to simplify the situation, make it easier for you. You know that when the situation is very tense, you're afraid that you may overlook something, you can maybe lose material or make any other mistake. Also, it makes it harder for you to plan things when there are some unclear elements of the position. That's why people try to make exchanges and keep it simple. But it doesn't provide the result that you want. The rule is to keep the tension. And now let's come back to our example and see what it means practically. When I'm talking about the tension, I mean the situation where two pieces are attacking each other. In this position, these are the two bishops, the light squared bishops. In such situations, you need to keep the tension and wait for your opponent to make that exchange. For example, if white now takes on the f5, it will favor black, as black will activate his queen and move it forward. Now the queen obviously became more active than it was on the previous move, and it happened due to white's move. Now the queen is ready to penetrate into d3, making a lot of problems for white, and uh, it's supporting the e4 square and all in all now the situation became slightly better for black than it was just one move ago. That's why in the actual game instead of bishop takes f5 white played queen to c2. White is increasing the tension trying to force black to make that exchange. And that's generally the right strategy. This is the style of playing typical for strong players. Weak players usually just release the tension. Okay, now black faces the same problem once again. 
There is his bishop on the f5 and black... Well, this time black needs to make this decision before it was white to care about the bishop. So what do you think? What should black do now? You may have guessed that taking on the d3 is not the best option. Although generally it is favorable for black to trade off the light squared bishops, because after that it will be easier for you to occupy the weak squares, e4 and c4, but nevertheless it will break another rule, the rule of keeping the tension. So black played bishop e4. It occupies the central square and at the same time it keeps the tension. Black would love to let white make that exchange, which will help black to either advance his pawn forward or bring his knight forward. In both of the cases it will be good for black. White played b5. Well, it seems like the attacking move, but in reality it rather helps black to transfer the knight to the good square. So what do you think, where the knight should go? Of course, we already know that you should try to occupy the central squares, and generally you need to move forward. Therefore, the knight would love to go through a5 to c4. But you can't play there right now. If you play knight to a5 straight away, that will be a tactical problem. After knight takes e4, you risk to lose that piece. Therefore, before knight takes knight to a5, black first took the bishop. This time black just had to do that due to tactical reasons. And now the knight can penetrate into white's territory. Now, what is the black's plan here? What do you think? How should black place his pieces here? We already know that your task in general is to control and to occupy the central squares. Therefore, if you look at all the pieces that you have, you can pretty easily understand what and how to do. For example, your a5 knight is going on the c4 square. Uh, the f6 knight will later on occupy the e4 square. The rook should go to c8 to strengthen your control over the c4 square. Another rook already stands well, and the queen, well, the queen will later on find the way to go forward. Ideally, we would love to go forward, like, somewhere to f5 or at least to e6, and also take stronger control over those important central squares. That's what you're going to do, and as you can see, once again, everything is really easy for black. Okay, let's go forward. White played knight g3, knight to c4, taking the bishop and hitting the a3 pawn. White played bishop c1, rook to c8. You see that black doesn't need to think for a long time about his moves. All of them are very natural, very simple. White played rook a2, trying to bring the rook into play, bishop f8. It's just to protect the d5 pawn so that you can free your knight, which may go to the e4 in the future. White answered a4. It enables the new opportunity for black. What do you think? How should black play now? Is there any way for black to improve further position of his pieces? Yes, there is a good way to play a bishop to b4. You can see an analogy with the previous game, where the similar motif could be used by black as well. Black is taking aim at the c3 knight, which is a defender of the e4 square, therefore black will be ready to eliminate this knight whenever you wish so, and occupy the e4 square after that. White moved the knight back, knight to d1, so that black can occupy the e4 square straight away. White played f5, he's trying for some desperate counterplay on the king side. As we have already discussed before, if you're keeping the very good control over the center, you should not worry about the opponent's flank attack. It will not be very dangerous, anyway. Now there is a question for you. Should you take the knight on g3 or not? What do you think? If you don't think that this is a good idea, then you're exactly right. You should keep the tension, remember this rule, to take is a mistake. When there is the opportunity for you to make an exchange, you should wait for your opponent to make it. 
If white takes the knight on e4, it will help black to either activate his rook, bringing it forward, or to take with a pawn and have the very strong passed pawn in the center. Therefore, knight takes g3 is a mistake. Actually, in the game between it played that mistake, <laughs> it took on the g3, which was not a good idea, and now you know why. Instead, he could have just played, let's say, knight to d6 with multiple threats. First of all, it opens the c-file for the rook, hitting the c1 bishop. Later on, you can bring your rook to c4, attacking the d4 pawn. By the way, the f5 pawn is now in danger after the exchange of the white side on g3. Uh, you can simply capture that pawn after that. Oh no, you can see that um, the white's position just falls apart and everything is so good for black. We will not analyze this game until the end. Again, below the video you can find the link with uh, complete games with analysis where you can follow up yourself and check the remaining moves. Uh, anyway, black won it pretty easily. In this video we've been talking about a few practical advices which we can learn from the games of Mikhail Botvinnik, the former world champion. The first key takeaway for you is to play in the center whenever it is possible. If you have a doubt of what to do, where to play, which plan is correct, just play in the center. Practically, this means that you should first of all control the central squares, take control over them by your pieces, and secondly, try to occupy those squares with the same pieces. Again, if you keep the right focus, things will become easy for you. People break this rule not because they are unaware of this rule. Everybody knows that you should be developing pieces towards center. Even beginners play like that. However, we know so many different themes, so many strategic and tactical motifs about a chess game that they can very easily mislead you and deflect you from the most important and the most critical elements. If you know what are those most important things, then you can keep the focus and make it easy for you while playing very powerful moves at the same time. The next advice is to keep the tension. Whenever there is a situation where two pieces are attacking each other, it is common for chess players to try to keep things simple and just exchange those pieces. However, this is the approach of weak players. Strong players know that you should keep the tension. If you release the tension, this is a concession to your opponent. The player who releases the tension improves the position of his opponent's piece. Therefore, you should not do that. Keep the tension and let your opponent make the exchange, which will favor an improvement of your position. Those were just two little advices that might sound easy or well familiar to you, but if you pay attention to the games of the other players, you'll see that they break those rules all the time, and they make those mistakes all the time. So just keep that in mind while playing, and I'm sure it will help you to improve your game and to play a few nice games and to gain some nice victories. So I hope you enjoyed the lesson. Most importantly, don't forget to keep these ideas in mind while playing and therefore to bring these ideas into practice to make sure that you actually implement them into your own games. Thanks for your attention and talk to you in the next lessons.